Coming up on the Diz Pod, we finally visited Space 220, our one night stay at Saratoga, why I hate the Tron virtual queue, as well as the usuals, this week in Disney, character spotlight, and parks blog local and international news. That's next on the Diz Pod. I'm the goat of Disney. I eat everything. All right, everybody, it's Corey story time. So kick back, relax, put your feet up, and get ready to listen to this one. We're not just going to report Disney news and just talk about it. I mean, that's already been done a million times. But then again, we do love Disney news. We will talk about some. So Tammy has me running all over Disney World looking for this new lounge fly. Jillian loves China so much that if she was ever lost, she would need a tag on her shirt that says, if lost, return me to China. Jacob's my dude. Jacob is my tech man. He makes me sound good. Welcome to the Diz Pod once again. I'm Corey Ellis of Living in Diz and so happy to be here for our 12th pod already this is crazy it's going so well getting some nice feedback and that's all i need to hear to encourage me to keep going i'm recording this one right now in the warm garage where i'm trying to maintain minimal movement so that i don't break a sweat after a shower see i'm recording this on a saturday so we're talking we're going epcot today lots of fun happening today at epcot on the live stream uh, which I'm sure I'll talk about on week 13. But we are definitely we're going to see Starship today. Uh, the family hasn't seen Epcot forever yet, so they'll get to see that. And the Easter egg hunt. The kids are still wanting to do the Easter egg hunt, but not only at Epcot, but here at home. The other night, I'm sitting and I'm watching a really great baseball game. And Tammy's watching with me, but at the same time, She pulls out the huge bag of plastic eggs that we have had for years, basically since these kids have been babies. And for anybody that doesn't know, uh, Jillian is 16 and Jacob is 14 at this point. And I was unsure if we were... See, we did the Easter egg hunt around the house last year. And I didn't even get to talk to Tammy about it yet as to whether we were doing it this year because the kids are getting older, you know, but we love tradition. Tammy and I want our kids to be as young as we can keep them. You know, what parent doesn't want to do that? So if having another Easter egg hunt means that, you know, we can keep them just a little bit younger, even if it's for an hour, we're going to do it. So she comes out and she comes dragging this big bag of eggs that's almost as tall as her, she's (laughs) 5'1", and she's like, I'm going to get started on this. And I go, oh, we're doing this again. So she filled them all. So I can tell you tonight, traditionally now, for like the last hmm, seven, no, six Easter, Easter Eves, we'll be home after a late park night, and Tammy and I will be hopping around the bunny trail in the house, hiding eggs so that when the kids get up, they can do the Easter egg hunt. And you know what? I am not complaining at all. I am so happy to do it because I'm on the same wavelength as her. Is yes, let's do this. I mean, I'll do it when they move out. <laughs> you know, when they come over after, you know, for for Easter dinner. Like, yeah, I know you're 25, but let's go do that Easter egg hunt after, you know, Easter dinner or something. But then again, you know, if they bless us with children, it'll default to the kids. But we can also put adult eggs out, you know. We can tell the kids, like, nobody touches the silver eggs. Those are dads. Something like that. We'll see. But that's what's happening. It is Easter weekend. And happy Easter to all of you and yours. And I hope it's a great one. But I will say, you got to hear this story. I guess this is this is a Corey story time. So what happened in the first Easter that we moved here to Florida, which was, uh, it was, we're going on seven years, but it's not quite seven yet. In a few months, it will be 
And we're used to having kids in Maine. We raised our kids for almost 10 years in Maine. Jacob was born in Maine. Jillian moved to Maine when she was like four months old. We were used to putting eggs, the plastic eggs, you fill them with chocolates and, and money. We were used to putting them in the house on our massive back deck and around the yard, front and back, and even across the street to my mother-in-law's house, all over the, the lawn. We have pictures and videos of Jillian in her snow white dress, walking around, picking eggs up off snowy ground. What do we do when we have our first Easter here? I start laying eggs, or laying eggs, yeah, I'm laying eggs. I start putting eggs all around the house with Tammy. And of course, we're saying, let's keep some so that we can put them outside. So we do this. I do it overnight. We come back out and the kids start collecting them. I open an egg and it's just full of red ants. Oh my. So quickly grabbed all the eggs that were picked up. Uh, off the ground from outside and had to just wash them all out, throw out the chocolate. It was a process. And lesson learned, we never put another egg outside. I mean, I suppose you could put money eggs outside, but we don't live in the country anymore. We live in a lot of those manufactured communities, not manufactured homes, well-built homes, but just, you know, everybody, there's like three or four different models of homes and yeah, it's just more congested. We were very, very private where we were in the woods of Maine. So it was a lot easier to do things like that. But that is probably my best Easter story. Not as good as my Christmas tree story, which if you listen back on, I think, the very first pod we did, Cory story time, how I crashed the tree on Christmas Eve. Yikes. Can I just say that the new rules for the Tron Virtual Queue just absolutely suck? I mean, I, I, I always try to play both sides when I make an argument, which maybe you should just stick to one side when you make an argument. But I try to see all sides, and I can see it. But for my own selfish reasons and for others here, see, listen. The whole world is not on vacation at Disney World. You know what I mean? Some of us actually live here and we work. And so our only availability, if not the weekend, to come to the parks is in the evening, which is what I do one to two times a week because that's what we live stream on our YouTube channel. And so for Guardians of the Galaxy... I didn't know how this was going to work. I, I gave it a shot, and it ended up working. And I, I am so thankful that Disney is lenient on Guardians of the Galaxy. And what I mean is, when you wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning, that's when, that's when the first virtual queue opens up for Guardians. So you have to get on the My Disney World Experience app, and you have to hit, you know, join the virtual queue. And when you do, if you're one of the first few people in 3.6 seconds, the queue fills up. And yes, it fills up that fast, sometimes faster. You do have a second chance in at 1 o'clock in the parks to get it. But you have to be in the park with your entire party. And that doesn't work for me during the week. So when we're talking... In the morning on a Tuesday or a Wednesday morning and I get it, I know that when I come into the park at 6.30 in the evening, I can check in and I can ride the ride. That is a perk that I think should stay for locals. Now, will it serve people on vacation too? Yeah, so it's going to serve us all. But how, you know, think of us in keeping it that way. For Tron now, it's different, and I'm just never going to get to ride Tron during the week unless I happen to get that 7 a.m., and then I land such a late queue that I can get on it later in the evening. So going to have to roll the dice like that. It is what it is. I do have a friend that is uh, higher up in Disney, 
this could be one of her areas that I can express my thoughts on that. And I think I will. And I can get back to you all on that too. And I just think that she usually sticks by her guns. I don't ever influence her one way or another. Although so coincidentally, there's so many things we've talked about that down the line they appear. And uh, I'll reach back out to her. I'm like, did our conversation have anything to do with this? And she's like, no. So two things. Either she's not telling me the truth, which I'm, she has no reason to lie. Or I could probably work for Disney because the ideas, there's, there's a handful almost now of ideas I've spoken to her about that had not come to fruition yet, but then come to light. I've talked about these things before, but not on the podcast, just on the live streams. And I'm talking things like when the pandemic hit. Uh, when you when fast passes existed, I told her that you know you should really make a change where y if you're holding three fast passes for the day, which is your max, but when you use one, you can gain another one. I said I hate the fact when I'm planning my day a few days before that you know you have to let one go to try to see if there's another one of a different ride that you want to get. And I'm like, that risks losing that one. So what do you know? What happened was, well, fast passes went away. They, she told me, they took the system, the computer program that they used for fast passes, they shut it down for fast passes. And when park reservations started, they ran the park reservation system off of that. So it was the same thing. The park reservation system, if you were able to hold three park reservations, I think that's what it was at the time, before it went to five, could be wrong, you had to release a park reservation to see if there was maybe a different park. And then you'd risk losing that park because they were using that same system. What happened later is they announced that they upgraded the system or are now running a new program. And to this day now, you can look at all other options before you modify and drop your park pass. This is the information we talked about. See what I'm saying? It was exact. And Disney wasn't operating on that. Were they working on it before me? No, they weren't because she told me that was a good idea and she'd take it under advisement, but hello, it happened. Another one big one was, and this is just to prove my point, another big one that happened was when we had to get a disability pass for my son Jacob as he came down with serious health problems a couple of years ago, I asked her or once I started using it, I suggested to her, I said, you know, we have the capability to walk all around the park. That is not the disability. So, but as I speak for others, us as well, but others, let's take a park like Magic Kingdom. Let's say we want to, we want to ride Space Mountain. So if we want to ride Space Mountain, but there's some low wait times in Adventureland or Frontierland, and we want to take advantage of those. But we want to ride Space Mountain, but it's a 90-minute wait. We have to go all the way across to the other end of the park to check in with the cast member, get a return time, and then go back to where the rides aren't so busy. And then say, okay, we can keep ourselves busy for 90 minutes, but then we're going to walk all the way back to the other side and take it from there. And your whole day could go like that. So I suggested, why don't you do something on the app where you can just look up the ride wait times and then reserve it that way, and then you don't have to go back and forth. So we talked about that. What pops up uh, a little while later? The ability to do that. So thank you, Disney, for doing that. That's awesome. And I'm just saying there's so many coincidences. So if anything, maybe I need to uh, freelance for Disney, how cool would that be? I'm always coming up with ideas like that. So for the Tron virtual queue, we need, I need to suggest that to her. 
uh, we really should have the ability to ride that later. And I know it makes better flow for the ride, I'm sure, if you come in at your time. And if too many people do it, it'll be too backed up. And they may even have statistics on Guardians of the Galaxy where, you know, hey, we tried this. And yeah, it's just not flowing as quickly. I'd like to see if Tron is flowing better because of keeping people to that two-hour window. That would be interesting. And I understand it, but I can still take my ball and go home and not be happy about it. But I have to live with it. So Tron may only happen on Saturdays with the kids, which is okay. We live here. But it would be fun to be able to do it now and then on a Tuesdays or a Wednesdays when we are live. We stayed at Saratoga. What a weekend that we had last week. We're on a roll with some great Disney weekends, let me tell you. The channel has just been hitting on all cylinders with a lot of different things other than just going to the parks. And it's ins I was already inspired to do some things like that before, where when we have back-to-back -back nights, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, is, I'm trying to make it where... One of those, we maybe don't go into the park or we're not in the park all night and we do a little something different around a resort and mix it up. And I haven't had to do that during the week because we've had some amazing weekends. So this weekend, and a shout out to my girl Kathy, very good friend of the family's. Uh, we might as well just consider her a family member. And she gifted us Saratoga for a night and it was really quick, but we're really appreciative. And we took it all in the best we could. I mean, we literally left the park after live streaming Saturday night, went to Saratoga, and it was probably close to midnight. We checked, we didn't have, and we didn't have to check in because DVC doesn't have to. So we just scanned our band on the door. We went in. We never went to the front desk. It, that is amazing. Love that Disney does that. And it was, it was late, and I really wasn't inspired to do a walkthrough of the room, but kudos to Tammy. Tammy encouraged me and pushed me to do it. So we did it. We had fun with it. We did it almost in one take. I still have to quickly edit that and release it and uh, should probably do that this week. So you can all see that on the channel when it does release. And just a beautiful – it's a beautiful – listen – Saratoga. Here's my deal on Saratoga. So Saratoga, I believe, is normally one of the cheaper DVC home resorts and probably cheaper points, I'm guessing, to use in a, on a general basis. So it's beautiful, and the rooms are nice. Tammy kept talking about how clean the room smelled because we all know Disney uses different scents for their rooms. It smelled really good. And I don't think, I didn't get into deep research, but I don't think Magic Candle Company has that scent, or they might. I just What Disney does is some of their scents will cover several resorts and rides. I just don't know if there's one connected to that. If you know that there is, please contact me at livingindiz at gmail.com. That would be great. But the room smelled great, super clean, super tidy, and... We hung out on, we had a balcony, we were on the fourth floor. It overlooked a beautiful, just backyard, courtyard area. So beautiful, well kept. It, it overlooked a body of water with a pretty long bridge. If we looked off to our right, we could see Disney Springs. We could see the peaks of the tent for Cirque du Soleil. And we could also see the hot air balloon going up and down. And... It was just a beautiful night. You know, we stayed awake maybe 90 minutes or so, and I was so tired. Out I went. We woke up, basically got ready, and uh, they have the nice big shower heads, for you know, that make, make you feel like you're under a rainstorm or in a rainstorm. So we did that, and we took off. So, but my issues with Saratoga is this, and it may be something, my issue with it may be something that you love about it, and it's as simple as, the resort is huge, and that's the problem I have with uh, 
not Coronado Springs, with Caribbean Beach. Caribbean Beach is massive. That might cover the most ground of any Disney resort. And I just don't like resorts that are that huge. I like walking distance, reasonable walking distance between things. And it's just so huge. Now, Saratoga has its own character, but Saratoga reminds me of a resort you could plop in the middle of Texas, uh, middle of Utah. It has its own theming. You know, it's horse theming. It's beautiful. Nothing wrong with any of that. It's just that I like places that have more of a Disney feel, and that has very minimal Disney feel. So size and lack of Disney theming for me is something that if all things equal, listen, if I can stay at Saratoga for free or we get or we get a deal, I'll stay at Saratoga again. But all things equaled compared to something else, I would stay somewhere else probably. And I'm even talking, if you're talking Pop Century, Art of Animation, All Star, uh, you know, and then anything else. I would probably choose that because we've stayed at Saratoga. Lots of great things about Saratoga. So I'm just trying to point out a couple couple of things I've always thought. The nice thing is it's really close to Disney Springs. So we woke up on Sunday morning and we live stream. Now we plan to just live stream the brunch over at Homecoming and then maybe take the viewers around for a couple of hours and call it good because as much as we like to be out on Saturdays, we are big time homebodies on Sundays. You know, there's a lot of sports on and I work so hard during the week. It's just a day I like to just chill and watch movies or even we'll go to the movies. It's just a super chill day. We need that one day before I hit the ground running on Monday morning again. So that was the plan. We went to Homecoming, and let me tell you, I thought Homecoming, I will argue that Homecoming is the best restaurant on Disney property for dinner. I think, I know, hands down, for brunch or breakfast, it's got to be Homecoming. Oh my, and if you, if that piques your interest and you haven't seen the live stream or you feel like in your mind you want to challenge it because you said, oh no, I've eaten here at a different place and this, I felt, walked away, was the best ever. I need to watch this and compare. Watch it and compare. We ordered three different plates and they were all phenomenal. Of course, I tried them all. I finished mine, which was difficult to finish. Okay, a little bit difficult to finish. It was huge. I had to pace myself. And what a great brunch to celebrate Tammy's birthday weekend, who's 25 again. Wink, wink. It was amazing. Uh, I had the hallelujah biscuit. And let me tell you, hallelujah. Did I just do that? 30, no, that one was $31. It was 24 bucks. Described as an open-faced biscuit topped with Chef Art's famous fried chicken, two over easy eggs, pimento cheese, pecan, smoked bacon, and smothered in sawmill gravy in a choice of two sides. So I added ham and Tammy gave her gave me her grits. I don't even know what else I got for a side. I can't remember. I don't even know if I did, to be honest. That's all I remember. And Jacob got the French toast, which was thick, thick slices of griddled bread dusted with powdered sugar. And they served that with spiced cane syrup and seasonal fruit. And he had a choice of sides. I think he grabbed some bacon. Tammy had... I don't know what Tammy ordered, but I know there was ham on her plate, side of grits, scrambled eggs, biscuit, fruit, 
Everyone absolutely loved this. It was an automatic five out of five Mickeys. And it was so good. The brunch could not have been more perfect. Especially for live streaming because the table that they sat us at, we chose to eat outdoors. And if you've ever walked by Homecoming, there's the bar. And a little further away from the bar is a wall. And on the other side of the wall is just the walkway where guests walk up and down past Homecoming to get to Homecoming. Our booth was right there on a short wall. So we were sitting right there as people walk by. And it was nice to set the camera up where viewers could see us. And we could also switch off and they could just see people walking back and forth. It was a beautiful morning. You could look up and see the balloon rising over STK, which is a beautiful steakhouse. And it just made it great. It was relaxing, so chill. The waiter was awesome. Shout out to Sherard. He was amazing. So we're sitting there, and this is what makes it even more magical. So it's Tammy's birthday weekend. Shout out to our guy Spencer and Fam, who is such a great uh, supporter of the channel, but becoming such a great friend. And that relationship will just keep growing at, because he moved here. And he looked me in the eye one day and he's like, we moved here because of you, because of what you've done with your channel. It just made us feel like we need to move to Florida and enjoy Disney. So we gained another Disney friend and we're so happy and excited to grow with that relationship. And Spencer, we got to talk about Kungaloosh at some point on the podcast. Uh, it's part of the Explorers Club, out of Skipper's Camp, T uh, Jungle Cruise, and all this other stuff. We, we'll have to talk about that, but uh, it's a word he brought to the channel while we're live, and a lot of times throughout the live stream, we will just scream, Kungaloosh! So we're sitting there, and a package gets delivered to the table by Sherard, and he's like, this, is, this was sent over from Amaretz, which is a beautiful... I don't know if I can call it gourmet, but I feel like it's a gourmet uh, pastry restaurant. And so she opens up the box. And we're like, huh? It was a dusted red rose. It covered chocolate mousse with gold flakes and said happy 25th on the side in the box. And it had a cherry inside. And we, she opened the card and it was from Spencer and his family which was so amazing. And so that happened. And just just a shout out to another set of great friends who we look so forward to having a lifetime relationship with because let me face it, Tammy and I, we need other couples. It's so hard to find friends that you can consider like family, you know, when you move or even when you get older. If, especially if you move away. It's just hard to make real, true friends that you love and care about. And our friends, Holly and Jeff, are, are that. And I, I feel like they're mutual. We have so much fun together. This is how you know how you enjoy each other's company. As, as much as I talk right here, that's how we all talk together when we're together. Like, we cannot stop. <laughs> if one person stops talking, the next one starts. It's crazy. And they know what I'm talking about if they listen to this. But so thoughtful and... And, you know, thanking them for their thoughtfulness is not even enough to do that. But they were watching the live stream, and they surprised Tammy with with treating us all to her brunch. And, you know, never expected, but so, so meaningful um, for them to think of, of her and, and treat her that way. That's That's amazing. We love you guys, and it is certainly not just for that. We are... Certainly, we have that connection. You know, you have connections with people. We got that connection for sure. So, it just that just really topped it off to make such a magical breakfast brunch. Go to Homecoming. Homecoming is unbelievable. That's all I can say about that, which was a lot. So, we, we went off and we were going to hit some of our favorite stores. And again, planning on being done by around two. 
or not by yeah about, about two o'clock two thirty, and we went beyond that this turned into a six hour stream but we had so much fun doing it and the first place we went was Gideon's oh my so we go to Gideon's which is a cookie shop which I have to be honest they've done such a great job with their theming that it it pulls people in you know let's make cookies that are like a half a pound throw a bunch of ingredients on them create some great theming and we'll pull people in now i'm sure that the business they have two businesses one outside of disney and one in disney now i'm sure the disney one the one that's outside of disney does very well i have no idea how well they do but I'm told you can walk in any time, no lines, no waiting, and get your cookies or your cake or your cold brew. But you put anything in Disney and come in with that theming and big fat cookies, you're going to gain attention. And they've been open for quite a while now, and we were there, and we're like, oh, let's go over and see if there's a wait yet because we've never been able to get our hands on cake. And they have these huge slices. I'm talking triple layer. And they're about nine bucks, and we got some. But I'm skipping. I'm skipping over. What happened was when we got there, we found out that it was a three-hour wait, and then we started to think, well, I guess we'll put our name on the list because who knows? If we're here and it's three hours and we get called, they might even call us before that. We'll just head over and get get what we want to get. And I do think the cookies are overrated. I haven't really ever had a cookie that is to die for. I really don't think they even reach a 5 out of 5 Mickeys. Maybe 3.75 at best. But when I'm there, I get them. They're big cookies. There are some unique combinations, and they're good. But there's plenty of places where I've had better cookies. That's just our opinion. And by the way, the cake was... The cake was average cake. I've had better cakes at Publix. But it's Gideon's, and I will say, the peanut butter cold brew, if you like peanut butter, that's the best cold brew I've ever had in my life, and I'll stand by that until something beats that one. So, oh, I have to mention, I've been babbling on, and sometimes I do record in the garage, and the air conditioner is on, so if we've been hearing that for the last five or ten minutes, I apologize. So we walk over to the girl that's handling reservations or the virtual queue to get in in three hours to Gideon's <laughs> so but mind you by the way I have like I bought three cookies in there in my freezer I freeze them and eat them little by little so I don't know whatever they're doing works but you know don't expect to have you not your socks knocked off by the cookies I don't think they're outstanding but they're good enough to buy and eat three hours worth no not really so <laughs> but we do it anyway I go up to the girl, and she looks up, and she starts to look at me. You know that look that you give someone like, wait a minute, I know you, and we both did the same thing at the same time, and then I saw her name tag, and I was like, Emily. She's like, oh my God. What happened was she was the former cast member over in China in Epcot, for the very epic magical moment that Jillian had with Mulan like four years ago. We ended up with two videos with Mulan, a part one, a part two, filmed on two separate days. I talk about it all the time, so I'm not going to go into much of that this time. Just go to our channel and look up Living in Diz Mulan uh, magic moment or Mulan meet and greet because there's two parts and I guarantee it if you if it's not super hard to get you to cry you will not have a dry eye after those videos part two for some reason did a little better than part one but part two is the most watched vlog on our channel at over 16k and man so I get the chills just talking about it. So just imagine all that, the magical moments. There was a million magical moments that took place in those two videos. I'll just say one of them was when 
Jillian and Mulan reunited because they contacted me and wanted to see Jillian again. When we were waiting in the China Pavilion at the very beginning of the opening of the walkway that leads you up to the big pavilion, Mulan comes out of the building, sees Jillian all the way down the walkway and screamed, Jillian, and ran. And they ran to each other. She hugged her and it was over <laughs> from there on out for the next 30, 40 minutes. Just crazy. So I say that because Emily was the cast member involved with this. And she says to me, so here's some behind the scenes stuff. Jillian, in the first meeting, took pictures with Mulan. They just felt from that meeting, that one character meet and greet, that Mulan meant so much to Jillian. So they, Mulan took Jillian by the hand and brought her into the pavilion and they sat down and she spent time talking to her about how grandmother, they sat by a cherry blossom tree and talked about how grandmother never picked flowers off the cherry blossom tree. She would take them from the ground and then put them in my hair. And she, while she's doing this, she's talking about putting these flowers in Jillian's hair. So the cast members were backstage talking and just said, listen, we have to make as many magical moments for this family that we can because, let's face it, not a lot of people show that much love towards Mulan. And you can watch the video for the ongoing magical moments. But that was some talk back there. And to take it further, this is four years later, and I'm meeting up with Emily, who was the cast member involved in doing this. And she tells me that she's still best friends with Mulan. And they watch these together all the time, and they cry every time. So it's a core moment if you want to pull from the movie Inside Out. This is a core moment in Emily's life, Mulan's life, my life, Tammy's life, Jacob's life, Jillian's life. This is a connection that will stay forever. It is such an emotional thing for all of us tied in. And to come full circle and talk about this with her, it's, it's unbelievable. Just so to be touched again by what happened four years ago to talk about it, it's like, it's like actors that filmed a movie and then you're reunited 20 years later and you talk about the stories and how much it meant to you. It's, it was like that, like, where are we four years later and let's talk about our experiences. I'm telling you, last Sunday was crazy with surprises, just a magical, magical Sunday. And, and Emily made magic for us again because she's like, listen, you are VIP. You're not waiting three hours. She's like, you're coming in to Gideon's with me right now. And we did that. We went into Gideon's right then and there, and we got our snacks and the cold brew, got the cake. And uh, like I said, Gideon's is good. Just don't set your expectations too high. Everybody's taste is different. You might find a cookie that you think is phenomenal. But as many Disney snacks as I eat around the parks and resorts, uh, Gideon's would fail to make maybe even the top 10 of cookies. So just take it for what it is. That those are our thoughts on that. Uh, I'm the only one that gets the cookies out of the entire family. <laughs> but there's a lot of times we do food reviews and I will totally go against them. So the other thing we did at Disney Springs was we took the stream sneaker shopping. Tammy needed sneakers. So we went and shopped sneakers at fit to run with a number two in the middle. And they have the Hoka sneaker, which is H-O-K-A. I'm a physical therapist assistant of almost 30 years. And we prescribe these or suggest these to our patients all the time. These are amazing shoes. Check them out for yourself if you want to. And so we had to stay live and she needed sneakers to walk around the park. I mean, the uh, springs because her, her feet were just, were just bothering her to this point. I'm like, you need new shoes. So they shopped with us and it was fun. And then we decided Jacob needed new sneakers too. So he got them. And the funny thing is, we got the same ones. We didn't even ask, but it's what was on the shelf. This particular shoe, the Clifton, I think it's Clifton 9, it comes in black. 
So Tammy bought black. Jacob bought black. I was wearing mine that I bought uh, like three weeks ago. And so we're walking around Springs. We're like, we can't believe we all have the same color sneaker, <laughs> same model. And what did you know? It only took a few days into the week this past week that I went to put my sneakers on. Jacob was already at school and I was trying to fit into his 11 and a half because he took my 12s. So I spent the whole day in crappy old sneakers because he had mine. And uh, it was funny, but not funny, you know, but more funny. So now we have to really make sure that we have the right sneakers so that that doesn't happen again. But all in all, to wrap up Sunday, Sunday was amazing, so much fun. And it, it, it inspired me to just say, you know, I think now and then we just need to make it, even if we're not staying on Disney property, I don't know, let's just go down and have brunch and walk around and shop. So we'll see if that happens again. The last thing about the weekend, and this is crazy because these were my opening notes to go over and it's going to pretty much take up most of the podcast, which is awesome, right? Because I love free talk. Just talking freely is probably what makes the best part of the podcast. So hope you're enjoying it. Space 220 Lounge. I rolled over in bed the other night and my computer desk is right near my bed. And I rolled over and I picked up my phone and I'm like, let me see if I can get into Space 220, just just on a whim. And I did. Uh, I, our reservation came up, 6.15, 6.30, whatever it was, and we were able to get in. It was for the lounge, which I wanted to do because the Space 220 restaurant is way too expensive. It's $79 for an adult. That's out there. Yeah, it's a little bit more than a character meal we're at you know 69 65 but i don't think it's worth it for what you get i mean i'd rather pay that much for characters and have a wider open menu but this is what i suggest and i'm surprised disney does this because in a way they're losing money on the fact that you can spend 79 a person or you can go would you call it a la carte where you can just order what you want from the lounge menu and pay less? So that's what we did because you, you're in the main lounge area. They're not separate areas. So we were able to sit in a beautiful, relaxing atmosphere and for half the price, literally half the price for all of us. And I'll get to the menu in a second. So the experience, we checked in. Within minutes, we went inside and we went into the elevator and if you haven't seen this, it's a circular elevator and you look down and there is a window. There's screens, which are supposed to be windows, on the bottom and the very top. So floor and ceiling. And it looks like we're blasting off from Epcot. And you go right up into the space station or the restaurant to eat. And when you come out, you literally feel like you're in space. Oh my, there are big windows. You're above the earth. There are astronauts that float by and satellites and asteroids now and then. The lights are dimmer and there's a beautiful, you know, theming around the bar. Just an amazing experience. It is so relaxing and so chill. Another amazing waiter. Can't remember his name, unfortunately, but he was amazing too. And I'm telling you, if we weren't live streaming that, we would have stayed another hour. Just chilling. It was that nice. Tammy got a complimentary uh, cupcake. The cupcake was amazing. Better than Gideon's cookies. <laughs> it was amazing. So good. And what we ordered off that menu was the Starry Calamari for $19, which was calamari, Italian cherry peppers, spicy marinara, and roasted pepper citrus aioli. Jacob picked that. I'm so proud of Jacob for picking that. Uh, I'm really proud that he branches out and tries different things. So we really like that. And then we ordered and shared the short rib sliders for 18 bucks. And that had white cheddar cheese, sriracha aioli, lettuce, tomato, and butter pickles. Both really good. I felt like I didn't get enough of the sriracha aioli in the beginning. So it was a little bit more on the plainer side. The meat was good. And if I remember correctly, I don't think it was super moist, but it wasn't dry. So I think I gave it a four out of five Mickeys on that one, the Starry Calamari. 
If you're about to start planning your next Disney vacation, book it with Your Magical Adventures Await. Claudia is creating Disney Adventures worldwide. She could create a magical adventure to Walt Disney World Florida, any Disney park worldwide, Disney Cruise Lines, Alani Resort in Hawaii, and guided group vacations with Adventures by Disney. Also, she is a Universal Studios expert. If you book with her, her services are free. Disney pays her to help you create a seamless, magical adventure. Her availability is really unmatched. You can contact her Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturday and Sunday, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Make your magical planner, Claudia Anderson, from Your Magical Adventures Await, 956-455-8049. You can also reach her on Instagram, Claudia Inderson, all one word. For more details, go to livingindiz.com to check out her ad there. Thinking about wanting to live near Disney? With over a decade of helping people find the home of their dreams, Victor is the perfect realtor of La Rosa Realty Horizons to help you find the home of your dreams. Go to DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com. That's DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com. So if you're interested to moving near the magic, once again, contact Victor Naraki at DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com and let him know that Living in Diz sent you. And now it's time for This Week in Disney History, brought to you by ThisDayInHistory.com, non-sponsored. It's just a great source to look up any day in Disney history, so you can check that out. We're going to start over on April 8th and just nitpick a few. There's so many listings on here. There's so many details. There's at least, seemingly, there's at least something for each and every decade. We're going to pick 1933 on April 8th. Disney's Mickey Mouse cartoon, Ye Olden Days, and the Silly Symphony cartoon, Father Noah's Ark, were both released. In Ye Olden Days, Mickey and his friends put on a musical play in medieval times. Mickey plays a wandering minstrel who saves Princess Minnie from having to marry Dippity Dog, later known as Goofy, the Prince of Poop Poop Badoo. Silly Symphony short. Directed by Wilfred Jackson is a musical retelling of the biblical story of Noah and the Ark. In 1962, the NBC TV series Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color airs Von Drake in Spain. Von Drake is like that underrated, very little used duck that looks like Donald, right? In 1998, at Disney MGM, Rock and Roller Coaster, which began construction a month before, sets the record for the largest concrete pour at a Walt Disney attraction. On this day, the Gravity Building's matte foundation was poured. In 2006, Disneyland Paris launched its newest attraction, Buzz Lightyear Laser Blast, located in the park's Discoveryland. This revolutionary attraction features spinning vehicles and handheld laser guns, allowing guests to shoot at targets and rack up a score, which is displayed on the dashboard of each space cruiser. It is the final Buzz Lightyear attraction to open, as every Disney park in the world now has a version of it. Moving to April 9th, in 1987 at Epcot Center, the Disney Trader Shop opens in the World Showcase. In 2006, Expedition Everest Journey into Sacred Lands airs on the Travel Channel. The special takes a look at Disney World's newest and most elaborate attraction, Expedition Everest, located in Animal Kingdom. That was in 2006. In 2009, Disney continues to test the new Characters in Flight balloon attraction operated by Aerofile, a company specializing in tethered helium balloons at Downtown Disney. Located next to the bridge on the west side near Planet Hollywood, the guests will be able to float some 400 feet into the air and on a clear day see 10 miles in all directions. The grand opening began four days later. 
April 10th, in 1927, Walt Disney delivers the first Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon called Poor Papa to distributor Charles Mintz in New York. In 1992, actress Daisy Ridley is born in London, England. She rose to international prominence through playing the role of Rey in the Star Wars sequel trilogy, The Force Awakens in 2015, Last Jedi 2017, and The Rise of Skywalker in 2019. In 2019, Mickey's Philhar Magic opens at Disney California Adventure, a 4D film attraction which first opened in Florida. The 10 minute long show features 3D effects and scents and stars Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, and a number of other Disney animated characters. April 11th, in 1983, at the 55th Academy Awards, Disney's Tron, nominated for Best Costume Design and Best Sound, is shut out. Best Costume goes to Gandhi, and E.T., the extraterrestrial, picks up the Oscar for Best Sound. In 1945, 18-year-old soldier Robert Sherman is wounded in the knee while serving in Europe during World War II. Just weeks earlier, he had led half a squad of men into Dachau concentration camp, the first allied troops to enter the camp after being evacuated by fleeing German military only hours earlier. And of course, he is known as part of the Sherman brothers who will make Disney history with some beautiful music that includes from Carousel of Progress, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. In 1995, the Ohana restaurant opens at Disney's Polynesian. In 2002, Disneyland Paris turns 10. In 2018, World of Color at Disney California Adventure closes unexpectedly following reports of damage to the underwater platform that supports the fountains, lights, and water mist projection screens used in the show. First debuting in 2010, the show included lights, fire, lasers, and fog with high-definition projections on mist screens. It would reopen in February of 2019. In 1965, the seventh Grammy Awards are held at the Beverly Hilton. Best original score written for a motion picture or television show goes to composers Richard M. Sherman and Robert B. Sherman for their work on Disney's Mary Poppins. Best New Artist for 1964 is awarded to the Beatles. In 2015, the Boathouse Restaurant in Disney Springs debuts with great food, waterfront dining, and dream boats, which was originally downtown Disney when it did debut, officially opens its doors. One of the new venues in the landing, the first of four planned neighborhoods as downtown Disney transitions into Disney Springs. The Boathouse is an upscale waterfront dining experience featuring spectacular floating artwork, dream boats from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. In 2017, Disney World confirms that versions of Club 33 will be installed at all four parks in the fall. Club 33 is a private club located in the heart of the New Orleans Square section of Disneyland, originally maintained as a secret feature park originally maintained as a secret feature of the park. The entrance of the club was formerly located next to the Blue Bayou restaurant at 33 Royal Street, with the entrance recognizable by the ornate address plate with the number 33 engraved on it. A second Club 33 is located in Tokyo Disney. Lastly, we visit April 14th. In 1969, at the 41st Academy Awards, Disney's animated Winnie the Pooh in the blustery day wins an Oscar for short subjects cartoon. Director Wolfgang Reitherman accepts the award, which is presented by actor Tony Curtis. Walt Disney holds the record for number of Academy Award nominations during his lifetime with 59 and number of awarded Oscars, 26. This evening's win is his 26th and last as the film was in production prior to his death in December 1966.
1984, the newly updated Alice in Wonderland Dark Ride, running since June 1958, reopens in Disneyland's Fantasyland. Residing next door to the other Alice in Wonderland ride, Mad Tea Party, this attraction allows Mad Tea Party, this attraction follows the same path as the movie, with guests traveling down the rabbit hole, guided by the Cheshire Cat. In 2016, Disney's California Adventure theme parks break ground on their highly anticipated attraction, Star Wars Land. That's going to do it for this week in Disney history, brought to you by thisdayindisneyhistory.com. A non-sponsored, but it's a great resource to Disney history. There's much, much more that I touched on here, so certainly visit it if you want to learn more about Disney history. Walt Disney World announces return of new annual pass sales. This comes from Disney Parks blog News, and the article was written by Eric Scott, Senior Manager of Communications. Disney fans, we heard you loud and clear. Wherever you can find us, you've been asking about Walt Disney World annual passes. It's great to see how many Disney fans are interested in becoming a pass holder and making memories time and time again in our theme parks. If you've been one of the fans or many fans asking about annual passes, then we've got great news for you. New sales of Disney Incredipass, Disney Sorcerer Pass, and Pirate Pass will resume and can be purchased online beginning April 20th. Please know as we look forward to provide a great experience for pass holders, the quantity of passes will be limited and passes or a pass type may become unavailable for purchase at any time. For eligible DVC members, we've got great news for you too, as you'll have the opportunity to purchase the DVC Disney Sorcerer Pass online beginning April 13th as part of your membership Magic Benefits. We are also grateful for our pass holders who have a deep, strong connection to Walt Disney World, and we are looking forward to welcoming more of you to the annual pass holder family, just in time to experience the feelings of a Disney thrill this spring and summer. It's an incredible time to be part of the Walt Disney World annual pass holder program as we've taken the feedback we've received from annual pass holders and are making exciting changes. Pass holders now receive access to select Disney photo pass benefits, age restrictions apply, and beginning April 18th, annual pass holders can visit the theme parks after 2 p.m. without needing a park reservation, except on Saturdays and Sundays at Magic Kingdom Park. Pass blockout dates continue to apply. Pass holders, if you're planning on visiting Disney's Hollywood Studios anytime soon, I recommend you try out the new Disney Photo Pass Muppet Vision 3D lens. It's a lot of fun. Ooh, we're going to have to check that out. Next time we're at Hollywood, we need to find out where that is. But we don't have PhotoPass. Hmm. Hmm. But I think we still get it through friends. So maybe with Neil, we'll have to do that. These updates will help pass holders enjoy some of our newest Walt Disney World experiences. We're celebrating the return of Happily Ever After Nighttime Spectacular at Magic Kingdom Park. The world's first Toy Story themed table service restaurant, Roundup Rodeo Barbecue at Disney's Hollywood Studios. It opened just a few weeks ago, and the Journey of Water inspired by Moana is coming later this year to Epcot. This month will also commemorate the 25th anniversary of Disney's Animal Kingdom, home of the favorite lands, Pandora, the world of Avatar, and we plan on being there on that day. For sure. For the latest news, current annual pass holders can check out the pass holder buzz available on the My Disney Experience app. To learn more about the renewal and pass upgrade options, visit DisneyWorld.com backslash annual pass. This week we will feature on our international parks blog news, Shanghai Disney Resort. This article was written by Brooke Collins, communication specialist for Disney Parks experiences and products the title is five ways to celebrate springtime blossoming at shanghai disney resort springtime is here and with it brings seasonal fun across disney parks at disneyland california adventure park celebrate the food and wine festival and eat your way across the resort or sip savor and stroll 
through Walt Disney World's Epcot International Flower and Garden Festival. Today we are shining a spotlight on Shanghai Disney Resort's floral experiences. The resort shines this spring with flowers galore and floral themed offerings in decor, food, and merchandise. Nature loving guests have so much to look forward to and we're having to share more details right here. Read on for five fantastic ways to celebrate springtime at the resort. So there's detailed decor guests can prepare to be enchanted not only by the beautiful topiaries but also the secret behind their creation. Planning starts early as the seedlings used in these topiaries are found half a year in advance. Seedlings are then carefully guided to grow in shapes of Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Daisy, Chippendale, Pluto, Goofy, Duffy, and Linabelle. Number two, seed stories. Did you know that the flowers are carefully chosen for specific areas of the park? See if you can spot some of these on your next visit, and you'll have to go to Disney Parks blog to see this article. But it says, follow the path to Evergreen Playhouse in Fantasyland, and you'll see that it is lined with Sarissa Japonicas, or Snow Roses, that give the illusion of snow as you approach the frozen sing-along celebration. You can also stroll through the Gardens of Imagination, which are filled with giant lupines that are shaped like castle spires, to pay homage to the enchanted storybook castle. Flower fashion. Each outfit of Duffy and Friends features a flower. See if you can find these flowers listed below as you enjoy your Disney Shanghai Disney Resort. And they have a list of flowers and they match up with the characters. So again, you, that's more of a visual. You can see this in the article. Sprout shopping. Beautiful spring florals aren't just found around the resort. They even make an appearance on limited time merchandise. Inspired by flowers featured on Duffy and Friends outfits, Shanghai Disney Resort's exclusive 2023 Duffy and Friends Floral Fragrance Spring Collection is now available. You can purchase your favorite Duffy and Friends character plush decorated with flower details. What perfect pals to take around the park to capture those flower picks and take sweet selfies with. Get a spring style with both fashion and home accessories, including Linabel crossbody bags and Stella Lou headband, as well as Duffy and Friends blanket and thermos. Floral food, I mean, what's a Disney celebration without food, right? So we go into floral food number five. This springtime Shanghai Disney Resort also serves up sights and smells for your stomach. Some delicious desserts at Celebrate Sakura, also known as the Cherry Blossom, include a Sakura-flavored chocolate churro and Sakura-flavored ice cream cone. What experiences caught your eye? Earth Month is just around the corner, and there's so many ways to celebrate the wonder of nature at Shanghai Disney Resort. Stay tuned for more. For today's character spotlight, we look at the beloved Stitch. Stitch, also known as Experiment 626, is a fictional character from Disney's Lilo and Stitch franchise, a genetically engineered extraterrestrial life form resembling a blue koala. Stitch was created by Lilo and Stitch co-writer and co-director Chris Sanders, who voices him in all Western produced media that he appears in. Ben Diskin voices the character in English versions of the Eastern produced television spin-offs, Stitch and Stitch AI. Sanders originally created the character in 1985 for an unsuccessful children's book pitched and developed a treatment for an animated feature starring the character. The idea of the character was shelved until around 1996 when then president of Walt Disney feature animation Thomas Schumacher approached Sanders and asked him if he wanted to pitch a story, giving Sanders the opportunity to use his character again. When Sanders said that the alien character was 
going to crash land in a forest filled with other animals, Schumacher told Sanders that the animal world was already over alien to humans and suggested that the character should end up in the human world to provide better contrast and juxtaposition for the story. In later development for the film's fictional story, the character was going to be the leader of an intergalactic gang of criminals with Jumba being one of his previous good friends summoned by the Intergalactic Council to capture him. The test audience responded to earlier versions of the film resulted in the change of Stitch in Jumba's relationship to that of creation and creator, respectively. The character was originally meant to be incapable of speaking intelligibly. However, when Lilo and Stitch production team realized that the film's story hinged on the character being able to explain himself at the end of the film, Sanders provided vocals for Stitch during an early animation. Using a distinct high-pitched nasal voice that previously used to annoy his co-workers, at the suggestion of co-writer and co-director Ben Dublois, who Sanders personally attributes being a co-creator of the Stitch character out of shared concerns that Disney executives would demand Stitch speak more than he needed to if they were to hire a professional voice actor, Sanders established himself as the official voice of the fictional character Stitch after the production team got used to his vocalizations. Sanders later revealed in a 2020 interview for Lilo and Stitch's 20th anniversary that Stitch's voice was consistently the lowest rated aspect of the film, according to cards that were filled out by audiences at test screenings. How about that? Stitch's screen history includes Lilo and Stitch from 2002, Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch Has a Glitch from 2005, Stitch the Movie in 2003, Lilo and Stitch the Series 2003 to 2006, Leroy and Stitch 2006, Stitch Anime, which was a series from 2008 to 2012 and then picked up for 2015, and Stitch AI, uh, which is Chinese animation in 2017. Stitch went by nicknames such as, or aliases, such as Public Nuance Number 1, Experiment 626, Kenny, Little Monster, Abomination, and Boojaboo. Stitch's abilities were superhuman strength, speed, agility, and durability, hypercognition, skill hand-to-hand -hand combat with forearms, ability to climb walls and ceilings, retractable claws, antenna, spines, and lower pair of arms, highly flexible skeleton and body, super sensitive hearing, and sense of smell. That's our character spotlight with Stitch. That'll do it for another week of the DizPod. Make sure you check us out on the Swell app. That's S-W-E-L-L. -L. We broadcast and drop five-minute podcasts throughout the week with the most consistent one being the post-live stream walkout from wherever we live streamed during the week. And you can usually count on those within the next 30 minutes of going off the air. And again, we, we drop every Monday, 9 a.m., a full-length podcast right here where you're listening to, and we hope you continue to follow and enjoy. If you want to contribute in any way, you can do that with right on Spotify with ad-free sponsorship. You can also check us out over at YouTube, our channel Living in Diz, and in the description of any video there, go to the live streams and the replays and click on those and you will find links for becoming a Diz Club member and also becoming a Patreon. There's so much to see over there. Check out our website, livingindiz.com. So many great things going on over there. You want to check that out. All you want and need to know about the members of the channel. You can sign up for our email list there so you're alerted anytime we have news. 
with an extended schedule of our live streams. It's a three live stream lineup. Those are typically updated every single Saturday's morning. And please send us some questions. We'd love to read them on the air here at livinginDiz at gmail.com. For Mushu, Jacob, Jillian, Tammy, I'm Corey from Living in Diz. Thank you so much for being dedicated to our family, our channel, our podcast. Thank you so much for allowing us to be your ticket to Disney. And we'll see you in the parks.